It's my pleasure to introduce to you a good friend of mine, Dr. Ian Murphy. I really appreciate that, Ian. Thank you so much. There's still way too much blood in my caffeine stream. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad you have me and father up here laughing at your terrible jokes. <laughs> you know, I, I know we're still in a state of prayer, but I just don't feel comfortable doing something like this if I don't open with prayer. So, just quickly, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, your people are here, and you are needed on this campus, and, and these are your instruments. They need to hear from you. Please don't let me interfere with that tonight. Use this unprofitable servant, and be tangibly, palpably, palpably but present in every heart here tonight. Don't don't let me mess up what you plan to do for everyone here tonight. And uh, have your way and anoint this whole evening with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. St. Teresa of Avila, pray, pray for us. us. Pray. I, my talk tonight, being a, a Catholic professor in a non-Catholic world, another way I could talk about that is the way I overcomplicate stuff would be another way I could entitle tonight's talk. Now, I'm reminded of a time in, in a, a backslidden time in my past when I was trying to run away from my calling. I was working a sales job. Nothing wrong with a sales job. We need Christians in the sales floor for sure. But it wasn't my calling. For me, I was trying to run away from God and hide out. So I was depressed and miserable, which is what happens when you're not doing what you're called to do. Totally derailed. And, and apparently, everyone around me was miserable, too, in this job. There was one Friday night where they put out a uh, floor-wide email to the sales floor of available overtime, paid overtime, plus commissions, because people, the lines were hot, people were buying computers, right? And, and if you sold one, you got commissions. So there was like a cash cow waiting to be milked by anyone who get all the sales to himself. Nobody, not even the money, was motivation enough for people to stay there one more minute. Nobody volunteered. And so they send out a second email. Look, the, the calls are hot. There's, there's money to be made. Just stay. You get all the sales to yourself. Nobody volunteers. A third email goes out begging for overtimers. Now, I couldn't, because I had great plans that night. As soon as work was over, you'd see like the Dr. M-shaped hole in the brick wall, like in the Looney Tunes, <laughs> of me jetting out of work that fast to get over to my brother's where I was going to go visit and hang out with my baby niece and nephew. I couldn't wait. I needed a baby fix so bad. <laughs> you know, Megan was an infant and Aiden was potty training. Fun ages. I just needed to get away from work and forget I was depressed. So I already had plans. I couldn't volunteer. But nobody... Nobody was willing to do this. Three attempts go by. And so the fourth email hits the floor and they change their approach. If you stay late tonight, we'll give your name to upper management. They'll know who you are and that you stepped up to the... But ten volunteers in seconds start hitting like you see it happening live. As soon as they said they send the name to upper management, it was far more motivating than all the money to be made over that evening. Meanwhile, back at my brother's house, Aiden's potty training, right? So, like, I feel for kids going through this. I really do. If you, like, think about it from a child's perspective, the terror. I think we forget, and, and it's, like, a cruel thing. Like, all, baby, it's a baby. Baby, understand, eat, don't be eaten. It's very basic. And here's a giant mouth, okay, and it's open. And if you hit this silver lever, it swallows and goes into the sewers where alligators live. And they have giant open mouths. Like, this is the bait. And you're supposed to, like, you can't even see into it. You just know it's an open mouth. And you're like, Duh! and you're saying, like, it's cruel. So they make these, like, trainer wheel johns, like these halfway plastic pots with the little white plastic bucket. So I, I think this is merciful. So, like... This is what they're doing with Aiden. They're, they're using a little white John, and he's still being rebellious about it. So, like, my, my, my brother can tell his little boy has to, you know, go. 
So he's like, got to go on the potty. No. Okay, we talked about this thing. You're a big boy now, right? You're a big boy now. You want to be a big boy? Did you tell me last night you're going to be a big boy? Yeah. Okay, well, the big boys crap in their pants? <laughs> Come on now, let's step up to the plate. Let's see it. Poo poo in the potty. No. <laughs> hey, Aiden, I'm, I'm your father, and I'm telling you, you have to do your business on the white plastic bucket. No. He changes his approach. Your uncle's visiting tonight after work's over. Think how proud he'll be. I'll tell him. Yeah. Aiden goes, I'll do it. <laughs> So I, I submit to you the question, what is the difference between what happened on a sales floor where I'm sitting around 50-year-old career professionals who have been doing this for decades, and it's, will you stay late? No. Will you stay late? No. If you stay late, we'll give your name to upper mid. Okay, I'll do it. What's the difference between that and poop on the potty? No. Do it? No way. If you do it, I'll tell your uncle, okay, I'll do it. There's no difference. There's absolutely no difference at all because grown-ups are just oversized children. <laughs> and we're not as mature as we'd like to think. We, we all just want someone to care about our crap. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just we overcomplicate everything. People just want to know their love. More than they want answers, more than they want intellectual satisfaction. They just want to know they matter. That's all they want to know. They want to know their love. That's the core need. And, and you can see it in a group of grown-ups as, as much as a potty training <coughs> toddler. You know, with the bell rings and I am out the door. I get to my brother's house and I'm getting out of the car with this toddler running out the front door. White bucket in hand. <laughs> I'm greeted by this. And he gets up to me, and, and you, you know, you can't go, you know, he's a baby, you gotta check it out, you know, you gotta be proud of him. So I gotta like, take the white bucket, let's see what we got here. Well, this is a fine specimen. <laughs> you know, Aiden, what this is, what we have right here? This is a champion. <laughs> Hand him the white piece of <laughs> he said it's a champion. Yes! <laughs> and I pictured the guy sitting next to me at work on their telling up management. Yes! <laughs> no difference at all. We just want security and significance. We want to know we matter. And it's funny how, like, when you get smarter, you get dumber, and you forget some of the basics. And that happened to me. I was in the middle of finishing up my dissertation on the new evangelization when the Lord didn't waste any time putting me to work doing the new evangelization. Now a specialist on it. During the year of faith, right? Exciting times. And he sends me out to Rosemont College for a full-time on-site faculty position in line to become department chair the next year. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not even done with my dissertation yet. And this this opportunity has just fallen on my lap. I knew it was from God because I applied for the job and I got turned down. So how is it like, how does that happen? Well, they, they announced the opening, right? And so me and all my friends at Duquesne were all putting our names in the hat. And my friends start getting callbacks. And, and some of them even start getting interviews. Week one goes by, I don't get a callback. Week two, week... Two months go by, I don't get a call back. I'm like, man, I wonder what was so wrong with my resume. What was wrong with my application? I didn't even get a call. So I just kind of said, well, that one didn't work out. When a couple months later, on a Sunday morning, I, I get this bizarre phone call from the chair of the department at, uh, of the religious studies at Rosemont College in Philadelphia. And he says, uh, okay, Dr. Murphy, I'm glad you picked up. I've got a strange proposition for you. See, we had this position open. I'm like, yeah, I know. And we had a stack of applications that was horrendous. I mean, these applications were so hideous that some of these guys weren't even worthy of a callback. So anyway, we're expanding our application pool. And so we looked around, and we found out about you, and we'd like to invite you to apply for the position. I said, I did. 
<laughs> and oh, I'm so glad to hear you're willing to apply. I said, no, you don't understand. I already did. Sir, remember that stack of applications that you said that I quote was like so horrible as to defy description that these people weren't even worthy of a callback? Yeah, I'm in that stack. <laughs> so whatever you found so offensive on my CV or my application, it's still in there. So can we just save ourselves the trouble here? He says, boy, do I feel sheepish. I, I, I've got to get off the phone here and see how I biffed this. Let me call you back. He calls back within 20 minutes. He's like, apologizing up a storm. That I, I don't know how this happened. I, I must have just overlooked your application. I am so embarrassed. Let me make it up to you. Tell you what, let's skip all this. Just come out for an interview. And then he hires me on the spot, which is nearly unheard of. So I know this is from God, right? Because I tried to go get it for myself. And I, I wasn't worthy of a callback. And then God gave it to me. And so it gave me like a lot of assurance that this was truly his next mission for me, the way it played out. I don't subscribe to Coincidence Magazine. Right? This is where God wants me, and I know it. So I go, and I am jazzed because I've been teaching world religions and comparative religious studies at secular universities like uh, Penn State, New Kensington campus, like IUP Maine. And, and that was getting trying. And at Rosemont, a Catholic college, you know, that I was going to teach Catholic thought, dynamics of the church, Christian spirituality, uh, a, a, my favorite course I was most excited about, an honors level course called The Meaning of Christ. Like, wow, no small task here. I'm this, like, relatively new being to the universe, and I'm just have to explain Christ's meaning. But I knew, like, there's no way I'm not going to learn from this. This is going to be an enriching experience for my own new Catholicism. This is, this is outrageously exciting. I finally get to teach Catholicism in all my classes. So I was stoked until I got out to Philly. Now, I thought New Kensington was a rough town. I thought Punxsutawney was a rough town. Philadelphia, like Rosemont is like right next to Villanova. It's, it's, it's in the outskirts of the Philly area. It's, it's part of the urban sprawl of that whole megalopolis. A lot of gangs in the area. And a lot of gang members accepted at Rosemont College. Now I had just come from a, like a Catholic event where like all the names were Gwendolyn, Penelope, Catherine, and Mary Mary Sarabeth. <laughs> you know, it's, and now, like, now I'm at this place, and I'm, I'm looking at my class roster on day one, and I've got a Ladasha, because apparently the dash isn't silent. <laughs> I've got a Quanisha. I've got a Jet. I, I've got a Kyle and a Katie. Some names I'm familiar with. Most names I'm not. No John, Mark, Stephen, and Peter anywhere to be seen. But, like, you got to get their names right. It's their names, right? you got to dignify them and get their names right. So I'm, I'm trying to work through attendance and pronounce some of them. I'm doing okay. Kwanisha's there. Ladash is there. Jet's there. And then I hit this one. I, I, don't, I don't know if this was a name. It looked like someone put the alphabet into a jar and they randomly pulled out letters and strung them together to make a sound. I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to need some help with this next one. You know, day one roll call here. i got to learn your name. It, it, is, is mal, and I hear from within the classroom, no, is mal. Oh, okay. I want to get this right. Help me out. Was that was that mal? No, is mal. <laughs> is mal? Okay. I really want to get your name. Is mal? No. Wrong. So I'm like. <laughs> and then I hear, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm nervous next time that class meets, I go in, Jet, Kylie, Manisha, it's comments. Mom? No! No! <laughs> So then, okay, I'll, I'll just put this behind me because it's time to go into my honors class, that honors Christology class. I was so stoked about, like, more than any of the other classes, the excitement level was tweaked. So I'm like, okay, this is going to cheer me up. I go in there, and I'm, I'm in the middle of roll call when the one girl says, oh, by the way, I am Zara, 
and I am an atheist. And I wanted to say, what? <laughs> <laughs> class. You're welcome here. No, I, I really need everybody to understand. Christianity has nothing to offer me. I'm an atheist because I'm intelligent. Oh, thank you for the insult, Zara. Somebody else raises their hand and says, I'm a fallen away Catholic because I opened my mind. Someone else chimes in, I left the church too. Someone else said, I'm an agnostic. I've just... And, and then I hear... I'm, I don't consider myself to be a particularly religious person, but I do consider myself to be a very spiritual <laughs> And I wanted to say, how do you spell that? S P U R C H A L. It sounds like a great name for a pet gerbil. <laughs> Spiritual, it just kind of has it. And she's like making these motions as she said she's doing like this. Like she's in a green tea commercial at Starbucks. I'm <laughs> not spiritual. Apparently these movements are spiritual. It's content before me. It's all just this emotive nonsense with no substance defining it. She didn't even know what it meant. Like, okay, so you're very spiritual. So I, I'm like losing my mind with all this. And, and heads, if you're hearing like, like attitudes from me that don't sound entirely Christian, you're probably right. I'm just being authentic about what I was going through. I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, promoting all of the attitudes you're hearing from me. I'm just telling you what, what happened to me. And I'm, I, I'm a broken instrument and I need a redeemer, so just, just don't be offended. Like, if, if you disagree with me, you're probably right. <laughs> I, I decide it's time for me and the Lord to have a wee chat about where he has landed me. So I, I go to this, I, I'm in no mood to cook, I'm in no mood to clean, forget dishes. So I find this ra random restaurant. It turns out it's a fancy Italian joint that was hosting a big conference that night. But they said, no, no, it's cool because of the conference. We do have a whole open dining area. You're welcome to eat here. I was like, you know what? This is just what the doctor ordered. I had this whole beautiful large dining room all to myself by a fireplace. You know, I've got, I've got a glass of, of coffee. I've got... Or ice water, I've got my mug of coffee, I've got my bowl of soup, uh, my salad, I'm waiting on my spaghetti, getting wined and dined at this beautiful mansion-like living room. I'm like, okay, thank you, God. We Okay, pull up a chair. And I'm all by myself, so I'm praying out loud. You know, one of the, I said, Lord, what were you thinking? <laughs> I, I can like, teach theology, forget that. I can't get through roll call. <laughs> my student's name is a noise. <laughs> It's not a name, it's a sound. I can roll call sounds like this. It is mom. No, it's mom. It's mom? No, it's mom. Wow? No, it's mom. Wow? Yeah. And I look up and this dude standing in the doorway going. <laughs> now I want you to think about it from this guy's perspective. <laughs> For just one second. He walks in to this super expensive Italian restaurant to this highfalutin conference and walks past an area with this man sitting alone in a giant dining room by a fireplace, eating soup, growling to himself. <laughs> So I said, Lord, this is so unfair. How come when Ma growls, I'm a loser? But when I growl, I'm still the loser. <laughs> Seriously, it's like, Ma growl, Ma growl, Ma growl. How's parent-teacher go, they go? Ha, this is my mom. Who? This is my dad. <laughs> and I look up, and the guy brought friends back, and they've got iPhones out. They're trying to catch this on YouTube. <laughs> this crazy man sitting there, I don't know, losing his mind. Okay, Lord, I'm just bad at life today. I go home. We'll try it again tomorrow. Get back in. It's Christology Day. And I go in Sarah's hand. I said, all right, what's this fresh bucket of crap? <laughs> but you can't say it out loud, because you've got to be nice. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Your perspective is welcome here. Please speak. I said, I was just wondering 
how you Christians justify your polytheism. I mean, you call yourselves monotheists, but you clearly have three gods. And I was just wondering how in the world you justify that. I mean, seriously, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Like, I just, I, monotheism, three persons. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about this here, and it doesn't add up. I wanted to say, Sarah, I don't understand why I don't see floppy ears growing out of your head right now. You're behaving like such a jackass, yet no floppy ears are sprouting forth from the crown of your head. It doesn't add up. But you can't say that. So, so I was like, okay, look, I, it's my job. I've got to feel this stuff. So I said, Sarah, when it comes to the Trinity, it makes sense that it doesn't make sense. Think about this. If, this. if this is really a revealing from behind the veil of the great mystery that accounts for all reality, it had better blow my mind. If we had a God that fit neatly into my finite, mortal head, if God fit snugly in my mind, that would indicate to me that that version of God was the invention of a human mind. If this truly is a revealing of the great mysterium tremendum, that it, it better, it better not fit. It better, because I, I didn't make God in my image and likeness to help me cope like Mark said. He made me in his. I don't possess the truth. The truth possesses me. God's bigger. God transcends this. And so it makes perfect sense that it doesn't make perfect sense. She says, wow, you're good. <laughs> that is a good answer. That answers me. That successfully answers me. <laughs> so she went home to rethink her life, right? <laughs> but I'm still an atheist. You know, sometimes, like, the responses would be so random, like, they would just make something up and make it sound like a debate. It had nothing to do with the words that came out of my mouth. Like, I go, like, true story, this is hypothetically, I just want to say this, I believe in a woman's right to choose, says one lady. So, all right, here we go. So I have to field these things, and I said, which woman are you talking about? The mother or the daughter? Because it doesn't sound to me like the daughter has any choice in this matter at all, whether or not she even gets to live her life. So how can you tout your position as supporting a woman's right to choose when you're taking away a woman's right to choose. Her reply, I could be murdering my son. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> no, you didn't get me. <laughs> oh, I got you. <laughs> so, no, you just agreed with me. That's a, that, thank you, that's absolutely right. You could be murdering your son. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, no. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> no, you most decidedly did not. You just agreed with me. Like, like, they might as well just like debate, debate, and then they say, but the cat's in the kitchen. <laughs> that, that has absolutely nothing to do with the words I just said. Oh no, he's in there. I saw him myself. He's eating kitty food. He said meow and everything. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Like, they weren't always so like random and incoherent. Like sometimes there were real debates, and I would win those because like I this is the truth, and I was trained in it. And this is what I do. I had another atheist chime in. He says, "You know what? There's no god-shaped hole. There, there's uh, talk about the last acceptable prejudice. They just take this tone all the time. My job was miserable. Like, I started hating going to work. I was just they throw fists at me. They yell at me. They attack. Like they the class would mob against me." Because I was unashamed of my faith, and, and it was awful. And he says, there's no God-shaped hole. There's no need for meaning. There's no need for purpose. I don't need to follow someone. I'm just an accident. There was a big explosion. I'm an accident, and it's lights out when I die. And I learned that from Richard Dawkins. He's my Messiah. So this kid just gave me the rope to hang him with in the debate, right? I'm like, it sounds to me like if your Messiah was right... You wouldn't have a Messiah. 
I thought there was no God-shaped hole. I thought there was no, no need to fill it. I thought there was no draw to a deeper meaning, someone to follow, a love void, a desire for real purpose, a real, a real bond with, it, with a hero who you can believe in and follow and, and get purpose from it. No, no, if Dawkins was right, Dawkins wouldn't be your Christ. Sounds to me like you think Christianity's right. And you do experience a God-shaped hole, and you long for someone to follow and deeper meaning and purpose, and you're just filling it with the wrong person. He says, oh, you're good. Wow. Oh, wow, that's good. You, you got me. So he went home to rethink his life, right? But I'm still an atheist. Like, like, the points were like literal points. They were just like weapons clashing into each other, making noises, and, and nothing was happening. And I swear, like, I, I'm the only person who has to go through this. None of, none of my colleagues have to go through this. The math professor doesn't have to d deal with this. No one who marches into his class. Um, I don't appreciate you pushing your base 10 number system on me. <laughs> my personal truth is base 6 number system, and you can't impose... Close your views. <laughs> I got engineering class. Like, do I have to make these train tracks parallel? <laughs> you know what? No, you don't. You just do whatever you feel is true in your own heart. <laughs> I, I'm not getting on that train. My medical class. There's this rubric here for the proper procedure for the removal of a gallbladder. You know. I don't like them imposing their version of this on me. You know what, don't let them. You, do, you just do whatever you personally feel is right with that scalpel. In fact, get creative. <laughs> like, if you think to amputate the foot part first, like, hey, who are we to do violence to your voice? <laughs> I, I, no other teacher. I'm the only one that they come in there and they, they're teaching me, my field, that they have no training in. It, it, was, it was absolutely miserable. And then in the Christology class, one of the Muslim students raises her hand and says, this time it's not a hypothetical, like with, with the other lady. This was real. This is a different person in, the, in that meaning of Christ class. And she t explains to me that she is currently trying to talk a family member into a late-term abortion. And, and I knew at that point... I better find a way to get through to my students, or someone's going to die, and, and nothing's working. I'm miserable, I'm depressed, my points don't work. Even when they're persuaded, they're just still a whatever. They still come in railing and ranting, and I, I, I'm alone and I'm in hell here, what's going on? And it was messy. When life gets messy, it's time to go to the freshman getaway. Tonight's talk has been brought to you by the freshman getaway. <laughs> like, when it gets messy, just keep calm, and consecrate, and go to the freshman getaway. Now back to our testimony. <laughs> you know, I, it occurred to me that I was inheriting the results of broken homes. Like in the, in the, my dissertation, I won't go off about that. That's, that's a different dinner. But the, the main thing I learned from JP, too, about this favorite topic of his was, and he got it from people before him, if we want the new evangelization, the key is to turn inward and re-evangelize ourselves. And I also learned that, that the basic cell of society isn't even the institution of religion, it's the institute of the family. All truth is God's truth, and his first introduction of his love to anybody is the home. That's anyone's first initial introduction to the love of God is through mom and dad. Every pope had a mother. Every president had a father. And like, you'll turn on the news and you'll hear every human institution touted as the alleged cure for all of society's ills. Everyone agrees society's sick. But then they start barking about what the solution is. It is a catastrophe out there in the kingdom of this world. Everyone knows that. <coughs> it's a good starting point, like... It, it, it's not working. It, the fall was an utter catastrophe. But yet they, they tout the government, education, the media, the military, the courts, civic organizations, the economy. One institution after the next is the purported cure to society's ills. 
and they'll talk about how Congress ought to run till they're blue in the face. But you start talking about the proper structure of a human family, and your civil liberties seem to vanish. It's like the enemy has rendered that an untouchable topic. You can't talk about Christ. You can't talk about his bride. You can't talk about the basic cell where God reveals his love to people. There are certain things that like, are an obvious threat to the kingdom of this world. Because Satan knows full well that if people talk about those things, if they talk about the Lord and his bride and the, the love that people are introduced to in this basic cell that show, introduces them to the creator's love, that they've just encountered God's plan for human happiness. He doesn't want anyone going there. But it's, it's this initial reflection of the Trinitarian creator. I mean, you've got, in the Trinity, you've got a lover and the beloved and the love between them as a third person. Where is this so closely mirrored in the creation? Right there in the human family, where you have a lover, the beloved, and the love between them so miraculously real that it's literally walking around as a third person. This is where we're introduced to the love of God. And I was inheriting kids from broken homes where they didn't know they mattered. They weren't getting security and significance. And they had grown in that broken direction for the past 18 years. And I was inheriting this insecure, dysfunctional mess that didn't know they mattered. Because they weren't being loved at home. I, need, I needed to do something radical if I was going to connect with these kids and, and do my job and make a difference and be, and be a good, excellent Catholic professor. So that's, that's when I had my epiphany to actually do what I was writing about. You know, somewhere along the line, the more theological I got, it's like I forgot that I had fallen in love. You can learn more about your spouse just make sure you're still in love with your spouse. Turn inward. I needed to turn inward. I could like, hear people like, oh my goodness, my friend need, really needs to hear this message. No, you need to hear this message. Oh, is this being taped? I can't wait to give this to Jack. Jack really needs to hear this. No, you really need to hear this. Oh, listen to this. Jack needs this. So no, I, I need this so bad. I need to get my eyes off the specks of dust in my neighbor's eye. I need to turn inward for my own repentance and focus on that. And then when it comes to turning outward, just make sure they're loved. Like this, this was like, just make sure they're loved. In other words, it's not about results. Get your eyes off results. We want quantifiable results. We're not utilitarians. We can't even make the seed grow. We don't bring the increase. God does that. That's not your burden. All he asks is, Throw seed. You grow with me. You be intimate with me. You spend your time with me. You give me your heart. More of it every day. Tell me what's going on. Intimately. Be with me. And when it comes to others, you throw seed. You speak the truth in love. You throw seed. The results are not your problem. You don't bring the increase. That's not your burden. Just keep throwing the seed. I make it grow. Oh, I was carrying a burden that didn't belong to me. And, and, and when I got my eyes off results, it changed the goal. Instead of the goal being, I need to see results, I totally switched my goal to touch something like radically different. Were they loved? And if they were loved, I win. God is love. Love is the lifeblood of reality itself. If they were loved, then God's very nature was expressed and God was glorified in that praise be Jesus Christ now and forever. Were they loved? And if I could go home and say they were loved, then I won. And God was glorified and seeds were planted. And then he takes it from there. And it was an honor to throw the seed in the first place. I, I forgot that I was in love. I had to turn inward for my own repentance. I realized that my attitude was so arrogant. As I, I postured myself toward my job as though my students were there for me. They were there to give me a happy life. They were there to give me a fulfilling vocation and give me a comfortable job and be a means for me paying my bills. Like, they were there for me. No, I was supposed to be there for them and wash their feet. If the problem was they were coming from broken families, then the solution was to be their family and make sure they, that someone was loving them. 
And when it's love, it looks different. I still have to field their questions. It's part of my job. And, and you're, you can't lie to them. You can't compromise on things that are uncompromisable. No one, you're not loving someone if you're lying to them. But when you're doing it because you care, it comes off totally different. I mean, really give a damn. These people are broken. They were made in God. They're, they're not the enemy. The enemy's the enemy. These are God's kidnapped babies. And there's still time to get some of them back. And if they were loved, they saw Christ, whether they knew it or not. He died for them whether they acknowledged it or not. I changed my whole tune. When it came to me, I turned inward for my own repentance so that I could renew this marriage. So that I could fall back in love with my first love. And remember, this is a, this is a best friendship with Jesus Christ above all else. I have forever to know more about my spouse. I need to be in love with him right now. And if I'm doing that, that's all I need to be doing. Were they loved? Became my new question. And then, how, about, how about this? I, I know this is, this is crazy. I started praying for my students. Imagine that. I, I know, crazy concept. A Catholic professor praying. Pray for my students. Like, really care. Not lip service, not just listening, not just get through it. But really, like, what's going on in that person's life? The Holy Spirit, if, it, if it's your will, tell me what to pray for for them. He would reveal things. He answers that prayer. He tells you what to pray for. I would bring things up in class, and lo and behold, how did you know to bring that up? I'm going through that. That was so helpful. It's working. Pray some more. Bring up this need. Sometimes specific words of knowledge. It was amazing. Like, we start, like, I was connecting on real human life. I, I tried to move away from the debate and to a different focus. God's image and likeness is in there. I'm going to find it. I'm going to locate it because they were made in God's image and likeness. But they're, they're a radical atheist. It doesn't change the fact that they were knit together in the image and likeness of the Creator, whether they're aware of that or not. Who gave his son for them, whether they're aware of it or not. Who has the hairs on their head counted and loves them so much he died for them, whether they're aware of it or not. So God's image and likeness is in there. I located it, I found it, and I spoke that to the surface. Anytime a debate came up, I'd field the question, speaking the truth with real love, for them, not to be right, but out of love. It sounds different when love's the motive, and then I'd lovingly switch to here's the image of God in you, and I'd speak it to the surface. It totally changes the page. One class, Zara starts mouthing off about something. After fielding the question, I located the image of God in her. I said, you know what, Zara? I know you don't believe in him, but I do. You just showed me Jesus. I am convicted that you were knit together in the image and likeness of God. And you just showed him to me. And I needed that. I'm going through something hard, and that helped me. You brought me closer to the Lord. Thank you. She looks like she's... I have never done that for anybody. I've ne never been able to help anybody at that level. Oh my goodness, all I am is mean to you. And you could see it start to act on her. Like they're going through real human stuff, real human experience. They're nervous about their careers. They're scared about switching ma majors or being away from home. They're they're worried about money. Sleep disappears, and they're on their own, and they're in relationship issues, and crushes, and breakups, and heartaches from their family and their love life. Real, authentic, human experience. And I could always connect there. And so we would like talk about life. They were getting to class early for the, for the catch-up on life. They were meeting me for lunch. We were having lunch together. They would bring me coffee to the classroom because Dr. M likes coffee. Like something was changing. They were being loved. I was being family to them. It just changed the whole page. Really caring, really praying for them, connecting on authentic human experience instead of hacking away at the dead branches I thought I saw so clearly in my neighbor. No, those were what I looked for in myself. Was I being naked before God? This is what's going on in here. Lord, this is what I'm afraid of. This is what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid you've abandoned me. I'm afraid I've messed up too much, but I've missed my call. 
So I can hear him say, I will never leave you or forsake you. You get real with him like that, it changes everything. You start really loving people and not worried about the results. Just make sure their love stuff starts happening. You can see it acting on all of them. And the whole tone changed. And we were hanging out. They were loved. I was repentant. And I was asking different questions. You know. Where they loved was all I worried about. I didn't care about results. And when you start really being the church, you don't, you don't just start seeing the Holy Spirit's movement. It gets the attention of the other guy, too. Like, we all deal with spiritual warfare in different forms, temptations, suggestions to our imagination. But sometimes spiritual warfare does something where it crosses this weird threshold, and it goes to a place that I like to call Padre Pio weird. <laughs> and, and it started to get a little Padre Pio weird all up in this. Like, demons were getting up in my Kool-Aid. They didn't even know the flavor of my Kool-Aid. Like, I was, like I, I'm, I'm going to work one day, and I get this intrusional, dark, in, like, doom-like thought. And not my own. It was, like, intrusional. I didn't hear anything audibly, but it's almost clearer than that. I said, that lady over there on the street, she's one of ours, and we're going to send her to you. We're sick of this. So I, like, look up at the lady... Like, it's the worst thing I could have done, is like, okay, I'll look at it. Like, you know, Teresa of Avila, she has like the demonic visage, like this manifestation of, of, uh, of spiritual warfare that was like visible. Like a, a scary countenance hovering above her. She just says, oh, it's only you, and she rolls over and goes to sleep. <laughs> That's not me. That's not me. I did the worst thing you could possibly do. I looked right at it and went, da! Like, I'm looking at this lady, and she starts twitching. The lady was pointing out, she starts twitching, then she walks up to my car. Her head starts convulsing wildly, and she starts screaming nonsensical babble. So I parked the car, I got out, and I cast the demon out, right? No, I hit the gas. I was like, I'm getting out of here. I get to class, I'm, I'm in Christology, I'm in, I'm in a, like a gospel-giving moment when wasps enter the classroom, start hovering in the air. Interrupting In that same classroom, ants started pouring out of the floorboards in piles, crawling up onto my students and biting them. We were on the second floor. How's that even popping? You know, and I swear there's an entire squadron of the demonic dedicated to technology. <laughs> Ill-timed blue screens of death, frozen emails, I just went to save the paper when... I see, like, they're in that stuff. The gremlins are real. The projector would go off, the, the laptop would freeze up. I, it, it, was, it was getting dark and scary, and I was just, why are you allowing this? Why, why, why? Why this? The, the problems in the classroom got so bad that facilities management forced us to move and change buildings. <laughs> because of everything the students were reporting. And then when they moved us to a totally different building on Rosemont's campus, the phenomenon followed us. I wish I could tell you I suffered well. I didn't suffer well. Like, I got rebellious, I got angry. I was, I was waking up tired. I don't mean just still sleepy, that's normal. But I, I mean, I was waking up exhausted, like at the end of a long day. There was no vacation could fix the kind of tired I was. I was in a bad place asking why, losing my mind, you know, and, and like then you know that's when like God shows up and you're like, oh, is that so he was this is why he like, oh okay, I'll suffer better next time, and he's all, no, you won't. <laughs> but I'll just use that too. Teresa Babel also says the only way to fail is to stop. We're not perfect, but we press on because Christ Jesus has already made us his own. Philippians 3:12. One day, I'm in the middle of this depression. I'm trying to survive this and, 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 and keep my spirits high because I see good things happening and the evangelization's actually happening and I'm seeing breakthroughs and I'm starting to get connect with my students because I'm loving them. And, and I'm trying to hang on to that amidst this distraction and I wake, I, I wake up before my alarm. That's unheard of. And I wake up to this sense of the Holy Spirit. This was the good one. 
It was un undeniably him. A unique experience across my whole life. Not, nothing before or since like this. It was like he himself waking me up like a kid on Christmas morning. Um, get up, get up, get up. I'm so excited to give you a present. I can't wait. God, he's under the tree right now. Come on, get, get up, get up, get up. Like, what? What is this? This is not me. I... I'm deprived. I'm in like one of the worst funks of my whole life. This is not from me. No, it's me. Get up. I can't wait to show. Can't wait to show me what? Is, is there something you want me to pray for? Yes, pray for Zara's conversion. I said. <laughs> <laughs> I said, have you met this girl? He said, he and I made this girl. Pray for it. Uh, okay, I prayed for. Zara to convert. <laughs> Drove to class that day, going to Christology, her hand. All right, what's it going to be this time? Got to be nice. Santa says, I've converted. I, I mean, my jaw's literally on the floor. He says, you don't understand. I've, I have encountered something in this class. As we studied the meaning of Christ, I heard a call within me. I wouldn't admit it. But I heard it, and that implied someone calling. And I'm also a smart girl, and I saw what was happening when I stepped into that classroom. There, was, there were strange forces at work, observable forces. And I watched them follow us. I tell you what, my eyes are wide open. I have given my heart to Jesus Christ, and I'm going to tell my parents. Tonight and Dr. M, I'm praying for you. Like it's like a modern day Saul of Tarsus, the department chair, the guy who hired me had to be like cover for one of his classes. She sh she sh shows up and visits and sits in on it to visit the the class that I'm covering. She's like, I heard that he's covering this. I just want you all to know that you got to listen to this man and he listened to his message because it changed my life forever. Because atheism. Stupid! All right, Doctor, let go for it. <laughs> Zara's become an unstoppable force. What's going on? And then the other students. I'm not a fallen away Catholic anymore. I went to confession. I was encountering the same thing. I'm back in full communion with with the church, and I'm going to be a Christian missionary for my career. Now Kyle chimes in. He's like, um. I, I also went back to confession. I also re-entered into full communion with the church, and I just started volunteering for campus ministry. Like, what is that? The agnostic challenge, she goes, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. The one after the next. I go to one of my other classes. The other atheist, like, I'm teaching this class, and I get another Holy Spirit nudge. Stop. Quit early today. Like, uh, it's specific. It's intrusional. It's not common. You discern the spirits. All right, I'm going to roll with this one. I think it's the Lord. All right, classic. And I knew the students wouldn't mind. <laughs> you know, this is the one job where your customers are the happiest when you don't give them what they paid for. <laughs> like everyone, you know what? We're just going to wrap up early today. That's enough for one day. Take the rest of the day off. their chair and thanking me. They leave. And I'm just standing there wondering why I was nudged to do this. I had the rest of the lecture. I still had to like cover it next time and try to catch up in the syllabus. This didn't make my life easier. I'm just standing there, get a knock at the classroom door. The other, the Richard Dawkins atheist who is mouthing off in that class walks in. He's like, um, are you teaching right now? I said, normally I would be, but I happen to be free. <laughs> What's going on? And he starts crying. This big, tough, intimidating guy that is the type that makes you feel insecure about your own looks. He starts bawling. And I said, what's going on? He's like, I wrecked my car. My girlfriend dumped me and my grandma died. I'm like, oh my gosh. He's like sitting down. He's like, what's going on? He's like, no, you don't understand. I just wrote a paper mocking Jesus in one of my other classes for the department chair, making fun of Jesus intentionally. You know how I get. And in the paper, I used images like, I bet if my grandma died, God wouldn't be there. And I bet if I wrecked my car, God wouldn't be there. And I bet if my girlfriend dumped me, God wouldn't be there. And then all those three things happen as soon as I turned in that paper. What's going on, man? I'm like, it doesn't sound like you're an atheist. It sounds like you're a full-fledged believer, and now you want God to shut up. 
He's like, that's right! That's exactly right! And so we like, and I just let him talk. You know, I let him talk about his breakup. I let him talk about his grief. That's real human stuff. I can, I can connect that. I can love him there. There's the image of God right there. Is a contrite heart. This guy's grieving, and love grieves with those who grieve. I could connect there. I could love him there. That was more important than convincing him of doctrinal ideas. He needed love. He needed his feet washed. He needed someone to serve him. And God set it up. And then I get the nudge, you know what, have his class outside, because his class was next. So we talked for the next hour, and then his class started, and, and so I tell him, I said, you know what, let's just, we have a small class, let's take Christian spirituality outside tonight. So I said, Lord, why do you want me to meet outside tonight? He said, I'm sending someone else by. I'm like, man, could you always talk to me this day? What are the lot of numbers? <laughs> <laughs> And then, then he shut up again. <laughs> so, I, so I do. I, I go. I have class outside, and the middle. The, the subject that night was Christian healing, and I'm in the middle of giving my lecture, and this Muslim girl walks by. and says, "I kind of been eavesdropping on your class tonight. This might sound really weird, but I want to sit in on it. I really need to hear about what you're saying. I need it so bad." Yeah, you're free. You come and join us. And she sits down. It was like the beginning of a joke. It was like a Catholic theologian, a Dawkins atheist, and a Muslim walk into a bar. <laughs> I, I was in the joke. I was like in the beginning of the joke, or outside under a tree. And I'm given this class, and then the class just went into the night through sunset into nightfall with everybody opening up about their need for healing. The Muslim girl's thanking me profusely. Because she needed to hear this message from Christ. Then the atheist and I are there by ourselves. And he said, what's going on? What's going on, man? And he announced a couple classes later to the whole class, a public apology, and that he had become a Christian. Another student read a paper about Augustine. He said, you know what, here's my paper. And he tore it up in front of the students. And he said, I'm making my answer to the question, that guy's answer. I am a full-fledged Christian believer. Dr. M, I'm sorry. I'm like, what is going on? And I'll never forget a three-hour phone call with a scary and angry Muslim family. But I got dirty, and I went in, and I had a group call with mom, dad, and daughter. And I spent three hours on the phone, and at the end of that call, the mom said something to me. I remember she said, I'm risking my life with our local imam with this. I am risking my life to say this to you. Dr. Murphy, we have encountered God in you in a way that we have not found him in the religion of Islam. And we are not going through with that abortion. You know, every, every, all eight students from that Christology class claimed the name of Jesus Christ at the end of that class. Three out of the four in my tiny Christian spiritualities class, including a former Dawkins atheist. Like the, the miracles, the things I saw, the things I started to see when I tuned in, when I made it about love. I'm like, I went into this random student not even in my classes three times in the same day. And I walked to her and I said, I don't subscribe to coincidence. I have been out of thousands of students. I've run into you three times across the day. Something going on in your life. Can I pray for you? Is there somewhere I can help you? Are you, are you in pain? She bursts into tears and says, you don't understand. I just pray God send somebody to help me. The stuff that starts to happen. I got it. Zara gave me a letter. And with and, and she gave me her express permission to read this to you. This is now her addressing you. You're not even hearing through. I want you to think about who's addressing you right now. She was quoted verbatim as saying, Christianity has nothing to offer me. I'm an atheist because I'm intelligent. Like this, is, this is Zara talking to you right now. She, says, she writes, God entered human history miraculously. Jesus' true personality comes from his unity with the Heavenly Father. In Luke, Jesus says he is the eternal King of Kings. He says he has the power reserved to God. Jesus showed signs to prove his divine identity. 
Historically, he performed miracles that amazed people and made them afraid. His teachings were original, not from any school. His beliefs were unprecedented and strayed from common beliefs. This is historically something amazing that took place and showed his authority. If Jesus was just some regular guy, there would be no way to explain his impact in history a mere 20 years after his death. Death could not hold him. He is still available to us when we need his help. You cannot disregard the miracles that hundreds of people witness and risk their own lives to share. I used to wish I could rewind time, take back words I said hurting people who I cared about, rewind time and take back wasted opportunities. It's easy to move forward pretending like nothing happened. But to realize your own faults and grow, that is a challenge, and that is precisely why forgiveness is so crucial. I wanted to be free from the guilt of bad choices. God loves me and wants me to be happy. God created me with the intention of living a beautiful life. I needed to face God with a repentant heart and say, I'm sorry. And Jesus Christ forgives my sins. I do not think there is any greater comfort in life than that feeling. You can be hopeful on this journey of life because the Heavenly Father is so amazing. The meaning of Christ is happiness. And I'm happy to share my thoughts and the small amount of knowledge I have with you. That's from Zara. He put her to work right away. The things I saw. But now it's your, now it's your turn. It's time for your stories. I, 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 I could literally go on all night with these moments, these intrusional thoughts, these special missions. A girl on a bench crying. God, what does she need? M&M's are her favorite comes to me. <laughs> I go to the store, I get M&M's, I run on a note card. It's all going to be okay, God. And I attach it to M&M's. I go back out, she's gone. I'm like, oh no, I, thought, I really thought it was the Holy Spirit. Am I like... Oh no, is it my own brain? I'm like reading God into it. Oh no, I'm going crazy. So I like, I'm confused. I go to my car on the opposite end of campus. That same girl, didn't know who I was, and didn't know what I drove, was crying on my front bumper. My bumper was wet with her tears. I said, I moved her to your car, saved you a trip. <laughs> <laughs> I go up to her, I'm like, she's like, huh? And I like hand it to her, she looks at it, her tears turn into tears of joy. She lights up. She says, he knows M&M's are my favorite. She gives me this big hug and goes bounding off in freedom. I, it, it's, it's time for you to see. I, I drove, I, I can't stop. I, I drove 40 miles on a nudge to visit a Chinese family that I hadn't seen in two years. And I walk into that restaurant and their daughter runs up and leaps into my arms, strangling my neck with a hug that Confucians don't give. They're proper. They don't hug like this. And I can't peel her off of me, and she's crying for joy. I'm like, kid, it's okay, it's okay, it's good to see you too. She said, no, you don't understand. I tried Jesus today. Like, I tried spaghetti, right? Like, I tried Jesus. I tried it. It's like, I prayed today. God, draw Ian here today. He heard me. He is real. And he kind of he cares. Th this is where it's at. It's the heart. It's all about the heart. And the Bible never said that it's out of the overflow of the head, that the mouth speaks. It is that don't get lost in that you have for eternity to know more about your spouse. Just make sure you're still in love with your spouse. Feed that. Feed that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So many burdens are not ours. We make it too complicated. His yoke is lighter. And this place needs you. You need to go salt this place. I needed you. I went out last night. I'll close with this. I went out last night for a prayer walk. I spent two hours walking this campus. And I was overwhelmed by a sense of darkness. Something, something very evil thinks it has a stronghold here and is panicking because it's about to be broken. It, it, it felt pagan and broken 
and I, I, I could feel broken hearts, I could feel broken lives, and I just walk, I talk to five people who are willing to talk to me, and I'm just praying for anyone who's pointed out to me for, to pray for. One person's pointed out to me, honestly, she looked like she was dressed like a professional prostitute. So I just started praying for her. God, let her know she has dignity. Let her know she has dignity. Let her know she reflects your image and likeness. I don't want her to be a kidnapped baby. I want her to know she's loved. I'm praying for this girl. She comes up to me at Sheets. She didn't know I was praying. Like, I'm buying something at Sheets. She approached me last night, came up to me and said, I feel like you're my guardian angel. That's a very nice thing to hear. I've been called worse. <laughs> she says, no, I'm serious. Across the night, I've seen you, and that's how you seem to me. I didn't have to do a thing. All I had to do was care. All I had to do was pray. And she experienced a light and dark place as something heavenly, something dignifying, something protective, Something she called angelic. And, and I, I, went, I got back home. I was vamped from just feeling the need out there. I decided maybe I won't go on a prayer walk here by myself again. And I needed to be with you today. I needed to spend the day with the salt of the earth who God has sent to this place. You're not the church of tomorrow. You're the church. Mary was probably younger than everyone in here when God birthed a miracle through her life. Timothy, be the church. You go get your own stories. You go love people and go salt this place. Keep it attractive. Keep it flavorful and keep it preserved from rot and watch what God unleashes through you. I'm here for you. God is with you. Go and disciple people in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. I'm available all night. But in a little bit, and, uh, and I think people like I, people could be like free to go. I'll open the floor to questions. I just don't want anyone to feel obligated to say if they need to to jet. So if anyone needs to go, that's totally cool. I'm available for questions as long as I've got. I'm all yours. So I didn't know if there were any public questions or. Yeah, sure. You mentioned the wealth of really very obvious and very intrusive signs, you know, and nudges so forth. <clears throat> but um, in a lot of cases, in, so maybe first question, would you say that there are as many, if not more, uh, subtle um, intrusions in your life as there are the very you know, overt and noticeable ones? I would say there's more of more. the subtle. So what, what do you do to notice those? How do you actually train yourself or how do you learn how to see the forest through trees? Or when you're right in the middle of the day for us. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what even even amidst the the more obvious signs, I was still very much in a dark night. Like not even the obvious signs were strong enough for me to feel clarified and whole. I I was I was just as confused and in the darkness and waiting to see why God was allowing this stuff as when things have been subtle for a while. That, like, interestingly, like, the darkness that I was experiencing was the same. Whether the signs were more blatant or more subtle. Whether the warfare was subtle or blatant. Whether the work was subtle or blatant. Like, I was, I was going through the same stuff. What helped me through it um, was practicing what Thomas Merton describes when it comes to prayer. I, it was him who helped me understand, and I'm paraphrasing, but saying prayers is a great way to start praying. You know, Paul says uh, to pray without ceasing. You know, well, I'm like, well, you can't do that. I've got to eat breakfast. I've got to sleep at night. Well, he never told me to say prayers without ceasing. But he said to pray without ceasing. 
It's like there's, yeah, there's a conversational prayer, like Abraham reasoning with the Lord back and forth, and that's very real, but it doesn't stop there. There's also prayer as a state of ongoing receptivity to the communion of the Holy Spirit and the sharing of the divine life. And that you can remain in, and we're called to daily. And it's, it's, I liken it to a radio station. It's like the God station is always broadcasting. It's always broadcasting. I've got to tune in. And part of tuning into that is simply tuning out my earthly cares. The, the Eastern Rite has a prayer they say at every Mass that I love. It's, they say, help me set aside all earthly cares. And so sometimes in just the, the process and the time that prayer takes, because we're, we have concupiscence, we're disordered, so there's a process to it. But if you bear with that process and you tune in, you tune out of the earthly cares and you tune into this endless broadcast, like, it, it's there. It's there, and, and you have the fruits of the Spirit. You have joy and peace, and you don't have peace as an absence of trouble. You have peace amidst trouble. And you don't have joy as an absence of sorrow. You have joy amidst sorrow. You remember that it's through crucifixion brokenness that resurrection life occurs. You remember that he plays his symphony. The maestro plays his symphony through broken instruments. And I'm a broken instrument. So that's a good place to be. And, and one thing, and this is very personal, because it might depend on what organ in the body of Christ you are, how these things manifest, but... What helps me tune in the best is a series of sovereignty prayers I go through where I, I open my prayer time basically like this, and I'll just go through it with you. Um, God, I don't invite you into my day. I enter the day you have made, and I rejoice and I'm glad in it. God, I don't invite you into my time. It's not mine. You're the author of time, and I get to play on a stage living that you created for me to play on. Like, God, I don't break your law. I break against it. Your law is perfectly intact. I can no more break the law of gravity. I could break against the sidewalk. Your law is perfectly intact, and I've broke against it again. Lord, I keep telling you how big this storm is. I need to start telling this storm how big my God is. And when I go through these sovereignty prayers, they help switch the concupiscence. They get me off the throne. I die to self. Like, in, in the end, like, like conversion's a death event. Like, this isn't the matter of a few revisions of some political opinions or cultural attitudes. Like, this isn't about me plastering my ideologies all over Facebook. This is a death event. This is, this is about the old ways are gone, and I'm getting honest about what's going on in here. So the way I tune, I go through my sovereignty exercises, and then I move through my honesty exercises. God, this is what I'm going through here. This is how I feel about this. And sometimes, like, the more honest you get, the more intimate the prayer automatically becomes. So th those work for me. If I go through sovereignty exercises followed by very personal honesty, I'll just, after a time in prayer, find myself tuned in, in that daily that we need. And however God's working and however the challenges are manifesting through the still quiet stuff and through the stormy seasons, like, he wants us to tune in daily. And he has stuff for us in all of it. He has stuff for us every day. So no matter what kind of season it is, he's, that, that station's broadcasting. That's an exciting thought. God's talking to you right now. So go tune in and find out what he's saying because he has jobs for you, has people for you to go reach, people for you to go love. So you can go be the church. And, and he'll, he'll steer them into you and he won't answer all your questions. A lot of it's a trust fall. Like, a lot of times, like, as an analytic, as an intellectual who came out of agnosticism in the first place, like, I, I look for answers when what he constantly challenges me to do is, this is not about your understanding. I didn't even ask you to do that. I asked you to trust me. So if you're left confused about a thing that you've talked to me about, trust that I heard the prayer and that I'm on it. Just trust me. 
And then like that day, I'll like steer someone into me that wasn't even on my prayer list. Often it's like I come to them with a list of 40 things. Only five of them do I have to actually act on. Like, and then he's had the other 35 covered. So like a lot of it's a trust fall. There's no formula because it's a relationship. It's more about trust than understanding. So the, the, those are the words I'd offer for a very honest and, and good question that I can personally relate to. Because when you're in a dark night, it's dark. You can't see. Even amidst blatant signs, ironically, you're just blind. You just don't see anything. It's, it does, it's not even rational. And yet, you can tune in, and he'll just use that too and his grace will be sufficient. And you'll come out of being like, boy, my, my resources weren't worth sufficient, weren't worth what was sufficient. But here I am, and he got me through it, and he used it. Ah, his grace was. Like, even when I wasn't faithful, he remained faithful. And, and it brings you even tighter. We'll use all of it. Just don't stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wondered if um, Eucharistic adoration played any part in, you know, going interior and, and giving you strength. But it, a lot of that, when you talk about dark night, and it's reminding me of Mother Teresa, and, and you know, a lot is being talked about with her right now because of her upcoming canonization and how, you know, she drew so much strength with two hours. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and she, so I just wondered if that played a part in, you, in your strengthening. So sure did. Like I, I've, I've even experienced some miracles at Eucharistic Adoration, some pretty wild ones. Like that is that is a great place to go tune in. Like it, it helps. Like there's just something. Like there's just something about praying there. Like it, God's just made Himself available in so many ways, and that's such a great one. Absolutely. And 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 when it's hard to tune in, that's a great thing I can do that helps. And, and tuning in isn't always about emotions either. Like a lot of times, like I find myself well, I trust that. I'm in communion with God right now. It's not just a motive. This isn't just about how I feel. Like, he'll, he, he's with me, and I just have to trust that while I don't feel it. Because <laughs> my feelings right now are, are not accurate. So, like, it, again, it becomes about trust. But often the emotions will catch up. The caboose will catch up when you tune in. It happens more often than not. And, yeah, I, I just can't amen that enough, Eucharistic adoration is so helpful. It's been so helpful. And when he, when he shows up there in like palpable ways, it makes you want to go back for some more. Like, like th those signs and wonders are great, but we can get attached to those too. And like, he's like, he did. Like, we don't fall in love with the signs, we fall in love with him. We don't seek his hands, we seek his face. So he knows, he knows what to feed us and when and when to wean us off. But he's always there. <laughs> yep, that's, that's a good one. This is, yeah, a, yeah. this is a much less deep question. But, okay, so, like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but was this all like your entire story? Was that happening your first semester there? That's all one semester? At, um, like, tonight's there? testimony all came from one semester there, but I was there for three semesters, and there were more stories that that's, happened during those. That's but, but all the like, stories from tonight all happened in one very intense semester. Wow. It was the fall semester. Okay. But so I how had, did you get like from there to tonight? Like, what happened since in five minutes? Maybe, however long ago. Oh, like, well, I you... fell in love, and my fiance was in Ohio, so I went to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> is that where the fine version of the university is? No, that's in Arlington, but they put me on their online faculty. Uh -huh. So, that's convenient. You can, like, work anywhere. Wait, so are you, like, married to a Browns fan? I'm married to a Husker. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, neither of us are from Ohio. We were just, okay. we, we met working at a Catholic camp. Okay. You know, sometimes event coordinators and keynote speakers maintain an appropriate and professional relationship at summer camp. Other times they get married. <laughs> anyway, I really appreciate you listening. It's, uh, I know it's a long night. You already like sat through classes. So I just, 
I'm, I'm here for you. Like, I'm, if ever I can help, campus ministry is my favorite. And this place needs you. It needs you so bad. And you just go love them. You, and, and you'll have your stories. I promise you can't not. If you're, if you're tuned in, if you're growing in Jesus, he'll use you. And just, just If they will love you, then you just stay close to him. You stay close to Jesus. This place needs you so bad. People out there are very broken, and they need you to be their family. Thanks, Annie. Thanks.